Welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar, one of the Hot Topic webinars, the next one in the series, following on from England team's tournament experience last Friday. Okay, so um, we're going to speak about principles of play. So just a, some quick introductions. Joined by Steve Guinan, who's FA player to coach lead in a new role. He's, he's also a youth coach developer, just like Jeff Noonan. So both, both from FA Education as myself as a education performance analyst. So I'm going to try and deal with deal with some of the tech uh, related issues if anyone experiences them and sort of man the conversation to try and get the expertise from the guys. And then we dealt with um, someone from the national teams and Richard Kyle, who's our under 17s um, out of possession specialist coast with the men's team. Afternoon, fellas. Hello. All right, you okay? Hello. Okay, so we're joined by, by over 340 people. The numbers will keep going up. Um, this will also be made available on the FA YouTube page um, if you want to refer to it uh, after this session. So without further ado, we'll kick off with a video. Nothing uh, nothing like watching football. I know we're all missing it as, as we speak right now. So uh, as you watch this video, just start to think about what the principles of play we're trying to show in this. Matt for sharing that. Um, afternoon everyone, my name's Jeff. I'm just going to try and take you through the first part of the webinar. Um, I've been given the task of trying to define principles, strategies, tactics um, and looking at some other stuff as well so we get an understanding of some of the terminology before we get onto the, the best bit and start to look at, at the football within it really. So the principles of play, those that have been on courses and, and accessed some of the FA stuff, um, have been around for years. And probably the best way to describe them is up on the screen there. It's a framework of how we as coaches can help look at what teams do to win a game of football. Um, and then within that, how do they apply them and when do they apply them? Um, and more recently, People have planted this seed, I think, about the next bit, that they're actually based on a performance problem. So we apply the principles around a particular performance problem. 
um, and some of the common ones at the moment, and we'll, we'll touch on them later on uh, when we get into some game examples, is teams that are now parking the bus, going in a low block, how do you use some of the principles of movement, support to penetrate but the principles are used based on what the opposition are doing. So does the performance problem actually come first? And then I think it's also quite a challenge to, we often interchange these words. So what, what are strategies, what are tactics, what, what are the principles? So the strategies we believe are the overall general game plans that, that we want to use it. So as an example, if the team is gonna go into a low block, <coughs> excuse me, how do we use width to penetrate? So in what ways do we want to spread out both width-wise and depth-wise to create um, a solution to the performance problem? And then within that, what tactics do we choose within the formation? So as an example, uh, where we've got Liverpool, how do we deploy our players? Uh, the debate would be that the 4-3-3 formation, they often play their front three very narrow and the width sometimes or more often would come from the fullbacks. Uh, so that then leads into a really big discussion about player profiles. What can players do? Where do we play them in the development pathway to develop uh, a full range of skills? But we thought it was important just to try and put some definitions on those terms initially so that hopefully then when we come into some of the stuff later on, um, that will help. And I guess the final bit of it is, those are the principles that we have, um, that we want coaches to think about when we look at the game. They are constantly changing within milliseconds to seconds within the game. So do we press, do we delay? How do we penetrate? How do we create space? And players are making lots of decisions based on context context is always king what are the opponents doing what's the score what's the time what are the profiles of our players what's the fatigue level so lots of factors come into these to these principles and the bit i think that's been a really good piece of work over the last uh, probably five or six years is the development of the england dna so the england dna is our way of applying game specific principles to win games of football. And it's not the way, I think historically the FA has always said, this is the way, but the DNA principles are our way and fundamentally players, teams and coaches have choice as to their way. So hopefully that's quite a nice little uh, whistle stop tour of, of them. And yeah, just a bit of a thanks to a couple of people in our organization who I've had long, long discussions with, Tom Curtis and Graham Carrick. If anyone is interested in some of the history of the development of principles, Graham Carrick has done a fantastic piece of work on it, but not not for now. But thanks to those two for the help on that, which leads us on nicely, I guess, to get into the, the meat and veg of our DNA and looking at looking at our terminology and language. Yeah, and I guess, I guess my sort of role within this is trying to link all your experience together and and go after this what we're trying to say, uh, opinion about what our principles are and how, more importantly, how that we bring them to life. Um, so I guess if we flip it over to you, Steve, in terms of in possession and, and really narrow the focus into that and some of the, the terms, um, some of the clarity we try and get across to our players. So we've, we've, we've put them up on screen now. So if you just want to layer some detail into that. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of words on that screen. Um, and am I able to be heard matt is that okay i've got a yes, message on yeah, my yeah. screen that's saying you can't hear me there you yeah go. no, yeah there's a lot of words on that screen um and we don't want to scare people off but they are basically words that we've just inputted on there for you to see from the from the dna language and the vocabulary that we use internally in the education department and also within national teams uh, the one on the left quite quite simply is a graphic of um at the whole pitch but predominantly playing through the thirds from what we call internally build create and finish the attack and i'm going to talk largely about the in possession principles um quite simply those of you that have been on courses in recent years uh, you can see that the pitch is divided into five lanes and, and we talk about um in possession making the pictures big as possible and utilizing the five lanes 
and hopefully that gives you a nice clear uh, depiction of what we try and do in possession and we'll go into a little bit more detail the slide on the right uh, how we play again it's just some of the vocabulary that we use and, and I would like to sort of reaffirm that the, these are words that are common language right throughout from, from Gareth Southgate right down to the under 15 manager and through uh, FA education. Yeah, and I guess what we're trying to show here is, is these is, these words and terms don't change where it is on the pitch. OK, so whether it's in the build the attack phase, create the attack or finish the attack, these overarching aims are what England teams are trying to do. Um, and to be really clear and give some clarity on that, message is really important i guess richie when you're coaching across the pathway yeah i think um as you say that the, there is a lot of words on there but i think the key the key thing for us is just making sure that there's common language and i think it's something I, i'll bring into some of the out of possession principles but you know the language is important for the players and the coaches to understand and i think if we get consistency within the language the, the understanding of everyone will will be better um as I say, the the word the words on there that is meaning to them, and we just need to ensure that everyone has that understanding of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I guess we, we've we've purposely threw these up to go. Actually, there's there's all these words. There could be all this confusion, Steve. And then I guess actually, how do you bring some clarity towards your message? Yeah, it, it's a things we we discuss quite a lot internally um, and in my role specifically around the senior professional game I, I spend a lot of time with coaches and managers who are in who are in the results business and we talk about it was well, do you have actually a, a sound uh, justification for the reason why you play um, some coaches genuinely do and it's, it's well thought of and it's through years of practice and experience and and some of the the younger coaches who are just coming into the game uh, some some genuinely don't and I think we're, our job, and especially my job, is to is to probe questions and to find out why that is, and to see if we can get some some clarity around it. So, the slide that's up on the screen now is a, a visual depiction of the current state of play in the Premier League in terms of uh, possession. So this was right up to date until, as you can see on the screen, game week twenty nine, which was just before we entered lockdown. And basically, the graph uh, shows up on the left-hand side the amount of passes that are completed in the defensive third. And the, the, the graph to the right and the line to the right, the defensive third to attacking third possession, they, those numbers, the 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, actually show the number of passes that each team has in order to be successful. So Man City, which you can see the outlier right at the top hand uh, right of the screen, basically indicates that Manchester City are very, very successful at uh, dominating possession, but not only dominating possession, actually transferring that into final third entries. Now, you look at the, the, the top right-hand corner of the graph where you've got Manchester City, Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester United, Bournemouth, Leicester, Brighton and Chelsea. There's a lot of the big six teams in there. Now, I don't think it's rocket science for anyone to, to look at that and think that predominantly most of those teams do actually dominate possession and that has been in their, their DNA for a number of years. You look down towards the bottom left and you've got Burnley, who is an outlier. But, you know, this is not a depiction of results. Burnley are actually sitting 10th in the Premier League table as we stand. But actually, in terms of dominate possession in the defensive third and what we would call playing out from the back, it's not too difficult to understand that they actually don't play out from the back too many times. Their game is predominantly based around playing direct football, second balls. And in my opinion, they do play some good football at times. They do mix it up well but again it's a nice it's a nice visual for you guys and girls on the call to actually see where your team or some insight into where teams fit into how they play and how actually successful they are in terms of turning possession into final third entries yeah and i guess you've got the link in terms of you've alluded to it with with brighton who have shifted um to a more possession-based style with the impact of, of clearly graham potter's philosophy onto that club um, so I guess what we're trying to show here is have coaches really got that clarity over the message and how they go about applying these principles? I think so. I think yeah, you look I, around I, at some I, of the teams. Sorry, Richie, go on. No, 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 go on, carry on. No, I, th I think you're right. I think you look at that, that, that picture and it gives you an idea of how teams play and how successful they are in terms of possession. But if you look at the international stage, you've got to know why you, you play that particular way. You've got France who actually won the World Cup, who are actually 19th in terms of possession 
uh, at the World Cup, and you've got Russia, who actually made it to the quarterfinals, who are actually only had, only actually averaged thirty eight percent possession. So why do you play the way that you do? Do you want to dominate possession? Okay, that seems to be a current trend in the market at the moment. But why do you do it? Because the whole idea is to score goals and actually keep them out of your end. So if you're going to dominate possession and have large uh, percentages of all 50, 60, 70 percent of possession, but you lose games, are you then going to ask yourself a question and think, well, we need to change our style and strategy of play because that's not working. Now, there's teams, especially at the international level, when you look at Russia, who are mentioned Iceland in previous uh, strategies actually turn the ball over or not necessarily at times to turn the ball over but they're quite happy for the opposition to keep it because their whole strategies are actually will entice them onto us and when we, we win the ball back and regain it we'll hit them with and we'll pace and we'll penetrate early so when I'm talking to coaches and managers in, in, in the modern game I'm always probing and asking these questions of well have you got the personnel to play the way you want to play because some teams want to have loads and loads of passes playing out from the back but is that going to be a year of success in actually creating that possession into shots and ultimately goals now i don't I think some of the coaches that i work with have real understanding of the way they want yeah so that leads me on perfectly to, to my next question is sort of if one of our one of our principles is, is penetration um actually what that looks like in the game so just put a put a, a still image here of of England against Netherlands, okay, and, and are looking to to penetrate in behind. Just talk us through that sort of detail. Yeah, do you want to pick up on that? Steve? I, I think it's a it's it's a good picture. Yeah, go on, Jeff, far away. No, I was going to say, do you want to pick up on it first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's a great visual because you've got. Uh, Holland, who, who are obviously playing a little bit higher up the pitch, they're not playing a low block, and there's no sort of detail and context behind that into where the ball was turned over and how the ball's actually progressed to that stage. But quite clearly, you've got um, England players who are prepared to run in behind um, and stretch the, the opposition, which is key. And most likely, uh, the, the team that comes to my mind in terms of who would uh, replicate those types of visuals would be Liverpool. Liverpool. Now, Liverpool have got you know an array of world class players who are threatening behind and run off shoulders. But again, that is not um, that's not off the cuff. That is worked upon in training, and you know, with, with a privileged position we're in and being around some of the national squads, you know that that is worked in because you're actually quite lucky to see them train. And I look at Liverpool and I speak to people who who are there at the football club. And in terms of actual practice design, if you've got players who are you're uh, looking at that picture, the likes of Raheem Sterling. Um, people who want to run off shoulders and spin and, and stretch into the space, how does that actually re relate and link to your practice design and training? Because if you think about it quite um, quite visually on a pitch, do you go for a long and narrow pitch where you've actually got more space where those balls can be allowed and you can just see potentially that ball being threaded in between the Dutch two centre halves for, 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 for Sterling to run onto? Or do you actually, what I see quite a lot is quite tight um possession games where there's not actually many room at all so what you're going to get is lots of combination play lots of rotations lots of up and back and sidewards but you've actually got no nice coaches i speak to they actually want this on saturday why isn't he running behind on saturday why is he not stretching the play because the space is there but all week they're actually constraining themselves to quite tight small practices now okay we're a little bit more experienced potentially there's some people on the call but there are some current coaches who are sitting on this call. So I think the understanding needs to be there that how do you link your practice, practice design and your training throughout the week to match day? Because it's got to be fitting for both and it's got to be aligned. Yeah, and there's some great, uh, great uh, conversation in the chat. John McParlin saying about your style of play will be dictated by the, the type of play you've got available. I guess we're trying to um, condition our players to play in a certain way. And I guess that's what you're alluding to, Steve, in terms of, how this then impacts on your practice design. So if you're clear with your principles, then how this actually impacts on how you design your practice and what messages you feed your players. Yeah, just uh, if we can just go back one slide on that before we, we get into that game. Yeah, so, just, just, yeah. Go on, Steve. Sorry, Steve. sorry I think you're, you're spot on, Matt. Yeah. I think... Um, 
you know, the fact having the previous background, I think that you, you need to have an understanding of who your team is, the strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you've got a big uh, type of player who's quite comfortable holding, uh, I'm trying to think of someone, someone like Kim Fenwa, who's, you know, it's at the game. You know he's not going to run in behind, but he's going to be extremely, extremely good at holding the ball up. So how do you link that back in Fenway into your personnel? Have you got other players that are going to um, almost mirror image his movements or are you going to do opposite movements? And people are going to run in behind and stretch the play to allow space for him to come to feet and vice versa. If you've got people like Sterling, Vardy and people like that who, who love running in behind, well, if people are going to run in behind, then that creates space for you in front. And you've just got to have an understanding you know, of who the strengths, um, what are the strengths of your key players and, and also what are the weaknesses, but also, as Jeff alluded to, the context of the game because the amount of coaches and managers I get around and the backup plan or almost game plan two is not worked upon. So sometimes when you're chasing a game and you need to actually get a result or you need to cling on to a game because you're under the caution, you won the up, have you got a separate game plan? And I've actually been witness to this on, <laughs> on a match day sitting on the side of the bench and it was like, well, we need to put X player on up front to try and get a win. And I was like, okay, well, what formation are you going to? And he was like, well, actually, I don't know. I hadn't really thought of that. Well, these types of stuff need to be worked upon. Game plan two, game plan three. Do your players actually know the understanding of each game plan? Do they know how the strategy and tactics of that game are going to hurt the opposition? And I think what we're going to come on to later in terms of the, the performance problems, well, depending on what the opposition are doing, if they are attempting to play a low block or a mid block or a high press, how are you actually going to hurt the opposition? You know, depending on the principles of play, are you going to penetrate early? Are you going to create space? Are you going to have really good movement and bright players who are creative? And ultimately, how are you going to score a goal? Because that's what the game's about. And, and just, just for, sorry, from a sort of international point of view, I think Steve makes some re really good points in relation to, you know, the principles and styles of each team. But what what we find that sometimes at international football with the with the youth teams is. You know, we watch certain countries play and they've got this lovely style of playing out from the back and, you know, they play through the thirds and then they come up against us and then they, they realise they obviously can't dominate the ball as much as they would. Have been. They completely adapt the game plan. So it's it's just a point from me to, to say around, you know, you've got, to, you've got to obviously make sure you've got an adaptable game plan because teams may change the way they come up against you. Uh, but at the, at the same time as well, it's, you know, especially being England, they, they up it by about 25, 30% in terms of the style of play anyway. And and I suppose when we get to tournaments, it's it's around finding a way to win. And some teams totally change their style identity to get a result. Um, so I, I just wanted to jump in there just to, just to give you a sort of insight of what we sometimes come up against, regardless of what the nation is. Yeah, and I guess it's this constant trade-off about if you're what you allow the opposition to do and then actually what are the opposition trying to do to you so it's that trade-off about uh, it's almost that chess message in it that that battle on the pitch yeah just i think to come on to this this principle in particular the penetration one you've, you've made some great points fellas about style linking it to players and the opposition um just some memories i've got i think probably over the last uh, few years but certainly around about 2010 that I think this principle actually got lost in amongst what was going on in international football at the time and with Barcelona. Uh, so I think we all became possession obsessed. Uh, and a particular story that I remember happening in an academy game was I wasn't taking the team, but I walked over to watch the game and our players were having a good spell of possession just around about the halfway line. And the subs started to clap and applaud as if we'd scored a goal. Uh, and what it turns out is that the coach had said to them, I want you to get 10 passes in the game. Um, and I recognise the value of trying to keep possession, but I think we lost the when and the where about penetration. And historically, looking back, actually, at the time, I think a lot of our practice designs round about late 2000s, 2010 onwards, were multi-directional possessions doing pass camps. Um, and I worry that we actually failed particular players where there's a certain player I remember in our programme who was pretty good at this penetration stuff, but I'm not sure we allowed him to practice it enough because he was he spent a lot of his time in multi-directional possessions, not working in a direction to hurt people. 
So I think one of the principles of your practice designs is, is there a direction to it? And that might even go back to you, your, your small possessions at the start or your rondos. Are you giving the players the option of a pass that goes through two players, which might be on a longer, thinner pitch rather than just in a square? But yeah, the, I think this one's interesting, this one, because how penetration is now developing is the pendulum is probably swinging now back towards teams are going to try and penetrate first. Uh, and I guess our understanding, obviously, if the overarching principle is go and penetrate, do that as a first priority. If not, if you can't, then control, show control and patience and look to build again. Richie, I guess that's the sort of terminology you use with the national teams. Yeah, we're always trying to sort of look forward, play forward and, you know, and put balls in behind and we always want runners in behind and, you know, we want to have that adaptable adaptable play. But at the same time, you know, we come up a lot against uh, low blocks, uh, people who don't let us have space in behind. We, you know, we've got really athletic players in the system who, who, uh, who can who can run all day and they've got explosive pace and, you know, teams recognise that and they, they do seem to sense their sit offers and they do try and compact it and, you know, we've got to find ways of, we've got to try and find ways of breaking that down in terms of, you know, we've got to have a variety in our play. We've got to make sure we create as much space as possible We've got to have different types of passes in the locker. We've got to threaten in behind to create that space. And um, we, we have got uh, to have them creative plays in the final third, especially to, to open the door, really. Um, and that bit of bit of brilliance that you look for from individual quality. Wonderful. So I'll just sort of bring it on into example practice of how you can sort of bring about these, these principles. Jeff, I know you have first-hand experience of, of delivering this type of exercise. Yeah, so this this game developed really off the back of our experiences of multi-directional possession and looking at were players becoming too obsessed with their past possession count. When you get the stats report through during the week and he's had an 80 or 90% successful pass rate, but actually is he a sideways Sid or can he go through and hurt people? Uh, so we developed this game and we actually made it a core practice and I think there's always an interesting debate about should there be core practices within your programme or not. Um, the benefit for us was the, the kids knew the game. It was on a Saturday morning. We played it for half an hour. They knew the rules. We could get straight into it. And fundamentally, it is the game. And what coaches then did were manipulation of the constraints. So how you change your pitch size. Is it very long and thin? Is it wider? dependent on your numbers, linked to your formation. And I think linked to what Richie's just said as well is where you set that killer pass area can help create either a high line to get people to try and run in behind, or actually if you set it very low, close to the keeper, you're going to get defenders who are going to sit right on top of the keeper. And then that is a real tight killer pass ball to play someone in. So you're hopefully trying to develop a lot of the skills around the box. And I think the final point on it, what's interesting often when I've done it with new groups is their initial strategy is just to go along. So the keeper will play it out and we'll normally get a long pass trying to drop in behind. So there's a real thinking process. And I, I guess the strategy bit of players working out, what are we going to do to get success in this game to score from a killer pass? Um, yeah, players enjoyed it. I think coaches enjoyed delivering it. It looked like the game. It had practice around the box. Um, and we thought it might be helpful, coaches, on the call just to, to get one example of a, a practice to take away as well. Yeah, there's some, there's some great uh, some de great detail coming in from the chat. Mark Cooper saying about risk and reward and, and giving players active decisions to make in the game. And, and I guess this practice brings all that together. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of it when you try it is um, you'll find out about your higher risk players, your safer players. Is it going to be a big diag to get someone in? Does the player who's the far left forward, does he pull off the shoulder? Does he make a run inside? So all the in-possession stuff about runs. And the other thing actually is about the ball up to a marked player. I think sometimes that's a challenge in our system about are we comfortable to play into a marked player? Like you talked about Akin Fenway. We roll it into him and then we've got runners off that, the third man run stuff um, and all the out of possession stuff that Richie's going to come on to. Yeah. 
And just, just to throw it out to you, Steve, there's a question coming about pitch dimensions and then would you use this type of practice with, with senior players out of your experience? Absolutely. I think this game could be used at every level, uh, just tweaked and adjusted depending on the, the physicality, size, power, strength of senior players related to youth. No, I, I think the lads have made some really good points. Um, I think a thing that I'd just like to bring up in terms of the killer pass game and, and thinking specifically about player profiles and number 10s and number 8s getting on the ball in those midfield areas higher up the pitches. You know, sometimes coaches and managers have got to have an understanding of those risk those risky players are prepared to take a chance to, to thread a ball through, whether that's over, around or through. They might give the ball away a few times because they're actually brave enough to get on the ball and try and attempt some of these things. But also they might be the, the type of player that can actually unlock a defence with one killer pass. But statistically, and again, we, we, we've, we've talked about stats a couple of times here, the amount of times I get around football clubs and I say, oh, he always gives the ball away or she can't do this and she can't make that type of pass. Mm -hmm. But the one one or two passes that they actually can make actually lead to goal scoring opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you know, the coaches on the call, it would be interesting to see what they think in terms of do they actually support and encourage those, those creative type of players who through the age groups may actually give the ball away a number of times, but when they develop up to the seniors and they start to make the right de decisions predominantly more, more, more often than not, that they're going to lead to to goal scoring opportunities or even goals. Now, sometimes with coaches younger down, they may actually be bringing those off the pitch, and I'm seeing that firsthand at the moment. Um, just just as a sort of a, another point, Emma's asked, "What would you define a killer pass to the players?" So, if you were working with your seventeens, Richie, what would you sort of what language would you use with them? Yeah, I'm not too, not too sure. It's uh, you know people have got their own terminologies for killer pass or a through ball. Or it might be a disguise pass. Uh, it could, it, it might, it might, it might be a, a, a cross. It, it could, it could be sort of any sort of different types of pass you can you can label you want. I mean, as I say, that the guys here obviously use their own terminology until in terms of a killer pass. But I don't think you can, you have you can put a terminology on any sort of word on on a pass. It might just be a moment. It might just be a moment of brilliance an individual who is very creative. Um, so I, 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 what I also wanted to say on that was um, coming away a little bit when we sort of out of possession head on is that it's, it, I've never done this game, but it's a, it's a really, it, it seems a really good game for the the 1v1 defending, the 2v2 defending, defended outnumbered. Uh, so I think, you know, once we're always looking at, you know, the killer passes and the, and the creativity, don't, don't ever neglect the defending side of the game because... You don't want to make it easy for them. You don't want to make them make that killer pass. And you know, there's a lot of defending aspects in that that you can that you can use at the same time. If you're playing this game, you can get multiple outcome outcomes within and out of possession. Because I'm looking at that thinking, oh, I'd love that. Because is, is he tracking the runner? Is he is he getting tight to him? Is he defending properly in a one v one situation? What's he doing when he's two v one? How does he defend the ball in behind? So there's so many outcomes from that game you can get, uh, but. You know, to get it done properly is to make sure you never neglect the, the defending side of the game. Cool. Yeah, I, I'd just like to bring in a point there as well, which I think is key, is that these type of practices are brilliant and I do see them at all age groups, is that, you know, it, an out of possession uh, rule of the game as such is actually offsides. Yeah. Now, I work with coaches and managers, I'm saying, for God's sake, please play the offside rule because you're teaching forwards or midfield players and those types of people bad habits because they, they're allowed half a yard, a yard, two yards because there's no one monitoring it. The defenders almost get penalised for that. And yet, you know, come game day, they're actually going to be flagged offside. And, you know, at the senior level now, when you've got VAR, you're talking about fingernails and toenails. So play the offside rule because that's what you're getting used to. So the more realistic you can make to the game, even in a 5v5 practice like that, it, it's, it's more beneficial. I think the other, the other bit on it, just to finish, is probably i didn't realize it at the time but it allowed players to get their receiving shapes right so that the, the language that we now use on look forward play forward within the dna in this game players either had to get their body round to be able to look and play forward or do something a bit more off the cuff creative around the corner with the outside of the foot little combination play um so it, it brought up quite a lot um yeah and i think at the time players enjoyed it so yeah just something to share Nice. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna bring the conversation on now into out of possession focus. Um, so same principle. We're gonna show a, a video that sort of 
hopes to capture some of the principles that we're going to discuss in a bit more detail um, later on. So, uh, Richie, I'm just going to bring it on into sort of your experiences. And my first question would be, um, how do you get alignment from the under-15s when players come into the national system to, to the senior end? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good question in terms of... Um, I've been at the FA now just short of three years, really. Um, so, and there was a real uh, strong identity, DNA, in and out of possession. Uh, and you know that that we've got lots of success from from the DNA and the principles that we've li lived and breathed, and and then you know what, as I come in, we start to obviously evolve and and change some principles around it. The in possession ones stayed robust, and but we felt like we just needed to tweak some of the out of possession ones, um, you know, because the the great work that's gone on, as you can see over the years, and the success that we've had, it was just about a case of just just adapting and just adding little bits and. What, what I'd like to say is, is that, you know, there's no right or wrong way in our eyes. I, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. This is the way that is is the, the, the way forward, I suppose. It's, everyone's got their own identity. Everyone's got their own principles. But at the, at the moment in time, this is what suited us throughout the pathway. And I think it was key to us to try and make it memorable, try and make it, um, try and make it simple, easy to understand. Um, from whether you were 15 to whether you were a senior player. Uh, so as you can see there, we, we broke it down into into sort of three into three principles of press and compact shape and 1v1 defending, which initially we think we had about six or seven. And what, what we tried to do was we had the 
six or seven. We wanted to condense it to make it shorter, uh, but more concise. Um, and we wanted it to be all over the pitch. So we felt that our previous principles were seen to be locked in. So when we're talking about high press and pressing, we felt like everyone just thought it was in the top end of the pitch. Whereas we thought, well, pressing can be anywhere on the pitch, really. You can go and press whether you're in a mid block, a high block or, or, or low. So we wanted to just open that up and and I'll go into a bit more into the pressing in, in, in a minute. But uh, we, we just felt that uh, we wanted to open our principles up all over the pitch for the players to understand that whatever we do it, we, we, we do it in, in every area. And it's the same with compact shape. We wanted to look at, uh, you know, you can be in a compact shape when you're high up. You can be in a compact shape when you're in the middle of the path of the pitch and certainly in the low path of the pitch. And it's your strategy on, on how you do that. And then the 1v1 defending was we wanted everybody to be able to defend well on the pitch. And that's not necessarily... Again, if the wing is running at you, can you full back defend? It might be your centre forward's going to go and press the ball. Well, does he know how to go and defend and put the brakes on and slow down and get his body position right? Um, has he got a mentality to, to want to defend? Does he know how to win the ball back? So, again, we just felt that principle based. We wanted it all over the pitch. And we feel that when we were doing this, uh, it was, it was uh, important for us to to really get that consistency um, throughout the, the pathway. And that was the sort of background on how we got to them principles. So I just wanted to just give you a little bit of a context and an insight on how we got to them principles. And it was all the staff in the national teams that, that come to come to the agreement. And it, it was, a, it was, it took a long time to get us to that simple, it looks as simple messages really. And what we wanted to do and how we, how we aligned it back to your original question was, you know, <laughs> We wanted the the players to be able to have a common language. I think it got brought up in previously in in the call. Was mm. are the players got a common language? Are the staff got a common language? And I think if we're all singing off the same hymn sheet and we're talking about counter press or it's a round not through, it's a mentality. The players understand the wording. The players understand the terminology of of what we're trying to get across. And I think that was you know. The, the work that's I think that's why we wanted to make it concise and we wanted to make it um understandable for everybody and then the, the sort of next bit of the alignment process was was trying to develop this playbook so the out of possession playbook around having certain sessions about pressing what does pressing look like high high path of the pitch what does pressing look like in the middle what does pressing look like low same with compact shape, 1v1 defending, having lots of examples through the pathway from 15 to seniors of, of what pressing is and, and what it looks like. And then you've got your detail on the net, underneath about what is a pressing trigger, what, what does that look like? So again, trying to build a library of clips, good practice of, of uh, information and detail around how that looks for the staff and the players. And then obviously you can design your sessions around that. Now, we're not saying we have sessions that we say right we must do this session we're saying we've got a bank of sessions that we keep referring to that are there if the coaches need it and then what we're doing in the process now is trying to get them best practice and narrow that down to what are our best practice sessions especially for us when we're on camp we don't have lots of time so it's what sessions are effective and what sessions can the players really take some key messages home um so that that was a that was the sort of alignment pathway in terms of getting your language getting your sessions getting your clips so everybody knows we're all singing off the same hymn sheet and then on the back of camps um, we obviously review uh, through it the age group so it might be lee carsley from the 21s uh, speaking speaking to tom curtis at the under 16s or somebody else at the under 15s around about uh, what their principle what their principles look like on camp uh, what their sessions look like uh, Etc. You know, in in relation to the to the principles that we have, yeah. so that that's just a sort of quick whistle tour of uh, how we align, how we try and align from from fifteen to seniors, and then you know, always looking at how we can get better and develop. And for, and the real the, the the overriding emotion that comes out of that is is a clarity you've got. So if you're a player that's coming through the pathway, it's irrelevant who the coach or what age group you're in. The language is the same, and and that and that journey is 
is then familiar and the players can can hold on to them principles and carry them on through the age groups. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, I think that all helps with your, your review process. So when we're reviewing with the players, we use this language. So when we're going through the clips, you know, the, the game plan might look different, but you're still using the same principles. So if we're talking about triggers, it may be, uh, triggers in a particular you, you've you tried to t- you should try to funnel your way on what triggers you're looking for in this particular game but it's it's the language that they hear and they understand and if they go to the next coach a year later you're doing the same thing but i only think that can happen through reviews with the players and you're using your language but also reviews with the staff after camps and when you are looking back at good practice or maybe even bad practice or things that you need to improve on that you've got that language yeah, and, and something I'd encourage all the, the people listening today is, is what are they their principles and what are they going after? I know from my own experience of coaching players, we had a, a round is sound. Um, they were 13-year-olds 13, 13 and, and that sort of went down with them that that was all right for the opposition to go around us, but they're certainly not going through us. So it's about taking them words and giving some meaning behind it. Um, and I guess that sort of leads me on to my next point and going into that detail of if we take pressing and actually what is your sort of pressing strategy and what are the principles that are sit beneath that? Yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, again, this, this, there's no right or wrong answer. Everyone's got their own view on pressing, but it's what suited us and it what it's what suited what players we get in the pathway and in the system. And, you know, one of the key things for us is that we want to try and win the ball back as quick as we possibly can. We feel like we've got athletic players. We feel that, you know, teams try and I think it'll, come on later on teams will try and break on us as quick as possible so if we can win the ball back as quick as we possibly can it's important to us to to do that and um, so we need that reaction we need that mindset we need that mentality to want to go and win that ball back and everything we do whether that's a, a train and practice whether that's big pitch practice what whatever practice we do that is the message to try and keep that counter press and keep that mindset of winning the ball back as quick as we can now doesn't always happen. We can't always win it back. But then the next overrider message is, can, can we sprint back to get into position to try or wait for that opportunity to get it back again? And that was the reason why we were so big on the counter press. And I know it's a it's a big thing at the minute with Liverpool, uh, Liverpool sort of idea of the way they press, but it's just a sort of strap line we think we've always had through the pathway, even before my time. Uh, and then the next bit of detail we were looking at, we always thought it's all it's always good that everyone wants to press, 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 but it's when do you press, how do you press, where do you press? So we tried to make it simple for the players. We tried to make it simple for the, the staff to understand that, you know, that there may be triggers in people's game plans uh, where it might be uh, a right-footed left uh, left centre half. It might be a, a pivot player who's really weak in receiving. You know, we're not necessarily saying we are all out gung go, gung go, going to press everyone. Everyone's got their own game plan and their own strategy in doing that. But it's important that the terminology you understand. It's it's if it goes to the fullback, that's the trigger. We go and press. If it goes, as I said to you, if it goes to a certain player, it might be a square pass. It might be a bad touch. It might be someone receiving with the back to goal. It's just that I wanted to share that little bit of detail around what triggers are and how we do press on triggers. But it's it's a key it's a key theme for us when we do go and press, and then I suppose the next thing uh, f- for us will be, you know, we, we talk about this pressing mentality. But what does it look like from behind? Because if one goes and you don't know what you're doing behind, it it, it, it can fall down. It, it might not be the right situation. The the gaps may be too big for you to support behind the press. It it might be a situation in the game where you can't go, and that's why we go back to the triggers. So I think it's about recognising the press and making that decision when you're going to go, uh, but then everyone else re- re- reacting behind you. And then from that, it's what what does what does it look like to regain it? Because you can do all that work and then you could give a file. Uh, you could do all that work and, and you, you're not using your intelligence of where you should win that ball back or when you should go and win that ball back. So it... it you know that again. That was just a. I wanted just to share that little bit of detail around when we talk about press, and we've got that sort of sub principle underneath of of the, of uh, developing what pressing is. Now the the stuff in the white boxes is just some of the coaching detail we may use on the pitch. Again, it's not it's not it's not perfect. It's not you know it can still be developed, but it's just a sort of simple way for us to try and get our message across. 
and I, I guess if I link in with the in-possession stuff with you, Steve, about we, we spoke about sort of enticing the opposition and, and what are they allowing you to do, I guess that, that ties in hand in hand with this contrast between pressing and, and penetration. Yeah, I, th- I think the in-possession principles in general, I think you're right, because um, depending on your, your, your playing style and strategy, if I'm trying to dominate possession and ultimately try and score a goal, what I'm trying to do is almost disrupt and attract the opposition to, to make a poor decision. Now, just as what Rich has been alluding to, if I've got a player on the opposition and we're playing uh, potentially around the back in our, in our sort of uh, defensive third, if one of their centre forwards or number 10s thinks they've got a chance of winning the ball and they come out of their disciplined shape and go and press the ball and we're almost expecting that because we worked upon it, if we play through that and penetrate, even if we just took out one or two players and now we're at their middle third of the pitch and we've took out two players, that is an example of penetration for me. It doesn't always have to be a penetrating pass that leads to a goal scoring opportunity. I think that's what you know we referred to earlier as a killer pass that creates a goal scoring opportunity. But if you have players and you disrupt, attract, entice, whichever word you want to use, all of a sudden you're at them. You've took two players out of the equation, potentially, maybe even one, and you've got an overload. Now, whether that's 10v8, 7v6, 5v4, it doesn't really matter how it works, but that's exactly what we want to try and do. We want to try and attract and encourage some poor decisions. And I think Jeff mentioned the the, the, the the couple of words earlier. That could be just fatigue. It could be tiredness. It could be at the end of a game. It could be a bouncing ball, a bobbling ball. We worked on some, and I have been around football clubs and coaches when they've done this, they're almost deliberately slowing down the speed of the ball to encourage someone to come out of a pocket of space. And all of a sudden the tempo is moved up and we get momentum and we're at them. And I guess, Richie, that's why one of the, the main strat lines is your game with intelligence. So understanding that when, where and, and how you're going to go about it. Yeah. And I think back to your initial question, it's, you know, our, our teams might look different in terms of when that pressing happens, because depending on your opposition, your game, your game plan might might be different. So, you know, the situation that may be different, it may be, you know, for us, we play three games in 10 days. It might be a tournament where it's really, really hot and it's 30, 40 degrees. And I think you've got to take them environmental issues in that, you know, we we, we all, this is the way we want to play. But there, were, there, were, there is times and instances in international football where we can't just go and press all the time. But we might wait for moments to press, whether that's we wait in a block and then get, and get after them. But then the support looks the same. Uh, we, we've got intelligent players to make the right decisions on when to go, uh, but we we've got really athletic players in our system, and we encourage uh, we encourage the you know the the, the lads to, to do this because we, we feel that we've got the athleticism to do it. But there is times, definitely in tournaments, in whether it's a different opposition, it may be we're playing a real top opposition where we wait for their moments to press, and we wait and we've got to have intelligence and players who understand when their decisions are. Jeff, can I just ask from from your perspective about what this looks like across the pathway, so at different ages and stages of the player's development? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that in the last three or four years, this has become a really hot topic and it's become a really strong principle for most academies now, I think. Um, And it's probably if I do a list of topics when I go in and watch coaches work, what you're working on tonight this would probably be top of the list um, because you can get success from it. So often if we know that the other team is going to play out from the back um, and if we get our pressing right, we can get good success on it. Um, But what what I like on our bit and some stuff that's come up in the chat box is if we want to develop independent thinkers and intelligent footballers, the wording that's in there, is about when, recognise when to, decision-making, intelligence. Um, And I think that's the skill of pressing, isn't it? It's about recognising the particular moments. And I always remember there was a discussion about Lalania at Liverpool a few years ago where he actually is brilliant on the press. He will go and he actually doesn't slow down. And he was great at just getting a toe in, but there was quite a bit of debate at the time that if he's gone, what are the people doing behind him? So he's got that press, got a little nick on it. He's not slowed down. He's disrupted. So some people sometimes use that word. Uh, but the other players have to recognise that as well. So it's a, it becomes a team ethic thing or a unit thing. 
And, and I think it's a really good point. That, and, and I'm not too sure what people are on the call, but I think we've got to take this into context around, I think you can, co can coach this, uh, you know, from seven, eight, nine, because, you know, I, I started when I was doing the under nines. And, you know, I think back to the time of, you know, you, your 1v1 defendants and your 2v2s. I'm a big believer in all the small 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, to, to have that mindset of, of knowing how to defend, get exposed, you know, you're, you're pressing and you cover. I think, you know, regardless of whether it's under 17 or seniors or under nines, I, I think, you know, getting the basics right first down the younger end of the pathway from, from your nine-year-olds doing these small practices and you want, you want about putting the brakes on. I mean, I still find myself now with the older players still talking about when they do get out to the ball, slow down, don't get too tight, you know, put the brakes on. All, all sorts of principles you can do it as, a, as an eight-year-old. I think we can't neglect ne neglect that detail and that information. You can do early doors. Yeah, I think I'll just uh, intervene there as well and, and add some weight to that. I think even just some of the, the physical fundamentals, ability, balance, coordination, going right from the younger ages, if people will be cumbersome, boys and girls falling over, dangling a leg, and they will be making tons and tons of mistakes. But that's when you've got to sort of embed some of that detail and build upon some of those physical attributes that will develop over the years. And then when you get to seniors, some of the stuff that we are seeing at the, at the younger age groups at the senior side of the game is, especially at some of the some of the bigger clubs and, and better performing teams, is that some of the defenders are actually playing in teams that are so comfortable and dominant in possession, they're actually not getting exposed to any defender. Yeah. So they may have really, really good defenders at 10, 12, 14, 18. They get to the seniors and they're in successful academy sides, whether that's 18s, 23s but they're actually not getting exposed to a great deal of defending. So how do you actually develop those attributes and skills? Because, you know, defending is a skill, even at the senior end of the game, because that's vitally important that you can still build and work upon that throughout the ranges. And a great, great question has come in from Guido, which uh, leads on to, to my next point about how you, how, if you can, can you coach this intelligence? Um, and I know we've put a slide together next about how you go about bringing to life these principles across the pathway, Richie? Yeah, um, and, and again, this might look different to, to club because uh, we, we've got very limited time with the players and so we have to be creative uh, with, with how we go about it and obviously we've got the specialist coaching model in, in how we work and some people might not have a little bit of background on that, some people might not. But what, what we try and do is try and utilise our time and we try and stretch the players, we, we try and you know, make sure that they are taking ownership of their own own learning. But, you know, but in the practices that we do do, we try and work together. So I think pitch size has got brought up uh, earlier on in the, in the conversation. We try and make it look like the game. I think um, we've got to make sure, especially when teams come up against the, the, the England teams, is that, you know, people do sit offers, people try and break on transition, people will put balls in behind, we'll get defenders, will have to get turned, they'll have to run 40 yards back. And I think if we don't do practices that enable to look like the game when it, when it comes to playing a Spain, Belgium or wherever it may be, then we, we're doing them a disservice. So, you know, in terms of, there's a slide on there that says about attack versus defence. So, you know, I'm sure everyone does it at, at the clubs where we're, we're playing and a, an 11 v 11 or it may be a phase but we try and do them practices whereas it, it's competitive it's it's challenge of the play we try and stretch them we try and get them out the comfort zone for example it might be me doing a high press against the the, uh, the other coach who was doing a build and we'll try and really press them and have a strategy of what we want to do to try and press the the, the opposition and try and stress out the the other team really to, to make it as realistic as possible to try and work their way out of it, try and problem solve it. And um, so that, that there's sort of just a couple of examples of what, what we try and do when we're, when we're coaching, uh, especially when we've got the, the two coaches up against each other, try and make it as competitive as possible. Um, in terms of uh, getting the principles across, we do a lot of IDP work, which is just an individual development plan when the players come, whether that working in units, one-to-ones, working at, looking at the, specific needs that that you know that we're just building on that they've done the great work that the clubs are doing and, and continue to do so we're we're trying to um be creative with with our work in the limited time that we do have and then obviously you've got the off the pitch um stuff which you know we've had a conversation in the past we feel like sometimes we're doing more off the pitch stuff than on because physically 
we can't do a lot uh, with especially the amount of games we have. So we find ourselves doing a lot of one-to-ones, a lot of unit work to try and um, get our principles across to them. Uh, we we try we do Sabutio work around Sabutio boards, which I'm sure people have seen. We try and give the players ownership for for their own learning, so they'll be looking at clips and bringing them back to us. They'll be looking at training, bringing uh, situations back to us, and, and challenging us on it. And again, I think it's the great work that goes out at the clubs that that gives the players the confidence because they're obviously doing a lot of work back at the clubs to to be able to do that with us. And again. It, you know, it might look slightly different for us, but what, what, what we do try and do is is stretch the players and, like I say, to make it look like the game as much as we possibly can. And and, and just watching your work, Richie, in terms of, you, you've detailed it here, you, you go general in terms of principles and then you, you layer that down and, and really zoom in on the detail you've, you've put about talking about units and individual work and then and then bringing it back to that bigger picture. Can you Can you talk about that cycle of... Yeah, I mean, we, we we we've as I said, we've got we've got a set we've got a set of principles that we that we try and live with and try and breathe it with the players, and the players are aware of what the principles are, and that and the the, the review process, whether it's training, we review every single training session that we do with the players. It might not be fifteen minutes, it might be five minutes, it might just be individual conversations, it might be group conversations, but what we try and do is try and review everything that we do so everyone's clear on it, and then what. What we what we tend to do with our our principles is that this is this is us and this is what we do, but the I think it got brought up at the start the, the strategy and the game plan is a different thing. So it, it's our principles within the game plan, and we might have strategies. We may, as I say, we may be high pressing, we may be waiting for the triggers, we may be identifying certain players, but again, we give players that ownership. So the players will do the game plan with us. We'll watch the opposition. It will make sure that we've got a good knowledge on what what that opposition does, and then we we will we will together take ownership with the players and the staff on and agree on the game plan, but not come away from the principles in terms of what what we want to what we want to do, and that might be, as I said, yeah, we have the time off the pitch to to do the one to ones, to do the units, to do the group work, to make sure they're clear on what we want. And just to throw it out to you, Steve, you've got some of your, your playing shirts in the background there. Um, talking about your, was this message received as a player um, and, and how the things look now compared to that? I think, yeah, Rich has made some good points. I think, you you know, I'm, I'm reading the, the chat box on the right side of my screen as it goes forward. And I think, you know, defending is relevant to every age group. Um I, I, I yeah I, I played I didn't have a distinguished career and, and made a made a living in the lower leagues predominantly but um, I knew my role my my role out of possession um, and in terms of making play predictable forcing play down one side trying to be in positions when I could just influence and be in a position to regain the ball if the ball was turned over I knew my role but I think some of the some of the some of the people on the call are coming up with some fantastic um, terminology and some ideas in terms of helping each other out. I saw someone put the idea of actually they're not defenders, they're counter attackers in my session. I think obviously some some basic fundamental skills and, and coaching practices where you allow every single player to experience defence and attack. I think we yes, we want defending to be um an art of our English players throughout the system and we want them to be excellent one way on defenders and, and team defenders, but we've also got to understand that they've got a place in possession. And how do we know that seven-year-old who's not a great defender or 16-year-old is not a great defender ultimately is going to turn out to be the best centre-half we've ever had? We've got to keep encouraging them to play different positions throughout the age groups, play up front, play in midfield, play at the back. And as you get a little bit older, we'll start to have an idea where they may be on the pitch. Um, and needless to say, I wasn't a great defender, so that's why I stayed higher up the pitch. Hey, Graham Fletcher saying you're a Cheltenham Town legend. So, <laughs> um, Jeff, just to throw it out to you in terms of making defending fun and, and really inspiring your players to to get that mentality and principle across. Any stories you've got to share? Yeah, probably two. I think one is um, Paul Holder, who's now come back to our organisation. He talks about in the foundation phase just the principle of swarm the ball, just go and get it and be like bees and, and get after it but not the precise detail of A goes here, B comes there, C comes round, and just a fundamental principle that's exciting to the kids to go and get it. Um, 
And I think the way that we described the defenders in our phase at the time were playmakers. So the two at the back were playmakers, which sounds much more, I think, more glamorous than defenders. But you start to build the attack. You, you know, you're on the ball, you're creating stuff. Um, but yeah, it, the big question that's out there, I think, has defending become a lost art? And in the development pathways, we often find that defenders pop out later on. So their experience is through academy football, and Steve said it, and Richie's experience in it now. How how do we still help develop players who love defending and love getting the ball back? And just just to bring it on to you, Richie, in terms of your experience of players you've you've dealt with on camp and and what that's looked like across your time working for the FA. Yeah, I think as I say, it's 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 wanting to value defending for me is, is the key thing so you know i'm always i'm there at the minute in my particular role is to, to give a you know in-depth detail and really study and focus the defending and the out of possession i'm really lucky in the fact that i get that i get that opportunity to spend all my time uh, you know becoming the best sort of specialist to become and and pass that on to the players but you know from the players point of view it, it does need to be valued and i think if you look at you know, it's 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 great, isn't it, to to have the sort of players who can score six or seven goals, and everyone raves about the the player who, who's banging them in the train, and rightly so. And you should always value that side of the game. But I think as coaches, we must always value the other side of the game. And that's not me being biased; it's just my experiences from working with under nine to senior players. Is that you can't lose sight of the of the value and the enjoyment of wanting to defend. And I think. If you instill that and you create that environment, uh, your environment in your, in your clubs and your practices, every practice that you do, then you'll start seeing the, the, the rewards, I think. And I think that's all I try and do is try and bring an enthusiasm, a passion and a, and a willingness to, to defend, but also value it. So when it comes to reviewing training, reviewing games, it's, you know, even though it's a montage of clips, there's, there's always an emphasis on defending clips and defend, the good practice defending and and as I say, back to Jeff's practice before, it was just, my mindset was all around. It's a great practice, but you can also get so much out of it defensively. And I think whatever practice you do, whether that's a possession, <clears throat> whether that's a small side of the game, a phase, you can always get that that bit of defensive aspect in. And that's not to say you neglect the in possession because the, you, you just don't do that. But it's, the, it's to get a balance of the both for me and, and never forget. Yeah, and just to bring together the, some of the chat comments, Daniel Henry said, create a love and desire for your players to have the ball. And then if they don't, get it back as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Samantha said about if the other team don't have the ball, then they can't score. So I guess it's that, again, we, we're talking about that flow of the game um, in terms of in and out possession and, and creating that real principle-based focus that your players understand uh, the key messages. Yeah, that, that definitely. And I think... Um... I just I always remember back when I first started, it was it, it was as simple as if you lose the ball, go and get it back. <laughs> yes, as simple as that. So uh, now we're going to talk about that bit in the middle. So we're going to we're going to throw it over to to transition. Um, I, I tasked Jeff uh, with the task of uh, trying to come up with a definition for this, um, which was a bit of a challenge, wasn't it, Jeff? Yeah, and this is uh, this is actually off our DNA and off our website where. The transition moment is debatable fundamentally about how long does it last. Uh, and I've spoken with someone at Opta over the last year or so about trying to, or do they measure it? And I know that some of our analysts have had conversations with them about how long is it? What is the moment? And what's interesting is they haven't got a definition or a measure for it. So it's not one second, it's not five seconds. If, but it's fundamentally these moments which can be half a second, a second when the ball is bouncing off a foot and you, you're losing it or you're gaining possession. Um, and I would say, again, linked to the pressing, I think this is something that over the last few years has become massive in the game now. We're seeing the best teams, I think, be brilliant at this, both out to in and into out. Um and I think that's the beauty of it. So there's not a measure. Some clubs, so historically, some clubs, Barcelona used to talk about, can you regain it in five seconds on transition? We've had a six-second fury. We, we've had lots of measures. And I think it goes back to what Richie said about the decision bit. So on the moment of transition, can you win it? And it might be you go and win it for five, six seconds, but 
at some point, whatever t second time you put on it, and that's a challenge to do that, but you then want the players to make decisions because if we keep flying round after it, we could get passed around and get hurt on the counter-attack as well. Um, so I guess really where we've gone in terms of developing it within our DNA is looking at transition from defence to attack and attack to defence. And again, I think some of the principles, so if we look at the, the column on the left, first of all, it's about sensing it, smelling it and feeling it. Can you feel the danger or can you sense the attack? So often now where we're getting teams in possession, so if we are a Man City and we've got pass sequences of 10, 15, 20, are the defenders or the people at the back still switched on to the transition and being done on the counter? And it's the same when we've lost it. If we are working hard to get it back, what's our forward doing who might be ready and springing off the centre half to get in behind or to deal with it? And I think what was interesting on the video, when you watch it back, if people go back and do view this, a lot of the goals are from the transition moments. There's a tour that wins it, there's a quick reaction, there's a break. So I think the, the first bit about it is, I, I, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but I don't think transition is a topic. So when I go into a club and people say, I'm working on tr transition tonight because it's in our syllabus, it's week five and it's week two. I actually think transition is a principle and it's a theme throughout everything you do. And it's not just something that you look at on a specific week. So in any practice de designs you've got, that front foot moment of getting players to react should always be in session. So if you've got practices where people lose the ball and win the ball, you're practicing transition inherently. Um, and fundamentally, by default, we're training the stuff on the left-hand column there, um, which then goes into the bit. We're training the anticipation, we're training the recognition, and then the response. So people have talked about transition being a mentality first, rather than an ABC positional thing. Um, and I would agree with that. If you get the mentality right in this part of the game, you can do really well on it. Yeah, and I guess you're right in terms of how the game's evolved. We've, we've seen terms such as rest defence um, come into the game. Are you, you've spoken about Man City keeping possession. Actually, are you are you ready to stop that, um, stop that transition? Richie, I'm just going to throw it out to you in terms of the work you do out of possession. How much of that is while you've still got the ball? Yeah, I think um, it, it, it's a really big part of the game, especially at international level, because like I said to you earlier, we, we do dominate the ball a lot in, in most of our games. And, you know, other countries uh, see that and they and they, they know that's what our game plan is. And they, they set up strategies to, to break on us and break quickly. So it's, it's, a, it's a, like I think Jeff made a really good point before around, your training sessions, we, we 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 don't have it as a separate separate issue. It's a case of any session that we do. We if we lose the ball, we can we can counter press. We can win the ball back as quickly as possible because that allows us to try and stop that break because we know we can be quite vulnerable uh, on the turnover. So if we try and get our sort of counter press right and reaction to win the ball back, again getting that mentality in every session we do, then then that will help us. And and the second point was around, you know center halves getting exposed and you know again with the bigger picture size they'll never get exposed if you're always playing in tight areas so we, we do open the pitch up because we know especially for us our games we will get exposed on transition we will get balls put in behind we will get channel balls we will get long balls diags so we need to be our center halves need to be aware and they need to be uh, switched on to when the play is in the finish the attack and when we are when we have got the ball that's when we're most vulnerable and I think Jeff said something about sniffing and anticipating. You know, they're the kind of things we're always talking to our defenders. And then I think the last bit around that is, what does your transition look like behind the ball? We've had many discussions in the national setup around, right, we're in the finish, the attack. What does that look like behind? Is it is it is it four defend? Is it is it five five defend five attack? Is it a box? What what is it that you do to to stop the transition or help you reduce the chances of getting done on transition, really. Yeah, and I think it's a great point about um, being proactive rather than reactive. 
because I guess if you if you're reactive, the, the time's gone and that moment of transition has passed you by, and now you've got to recover back to shape and towards your own goal. Definitely, and I, and I think that the big thing for me with the young players is is these days is is they they do ball watch a lot. They they do just watch the play, and it's it's about thinking like a defender, thinking it, anticipating, smelling it, being pessimistic really to think. Where where might this land? Where where might they break? So being switched on at all times to against these these counter attacks that happen, especially at the level uh, international level. Just a, I think a story to share on that as well of an experience of a coach that I worked with where I've been watched him work over a few sessions, and he would say to me that my players are on their heels. You know they're not responding and they're not reacting in that moment. They're often on their heels. Um, and when I'd watched a few of his sessions, he would always start with, so the players would often do like an informal rondo when they arrived and it was the 3v1, 4v1. And then he would also do a structured start with a, a small possession type practice. Um, but the challenge was that players, if they won the ball, didn't react. So if it was a 4v2 rondo type practice, the, when the two won it, they just boot it out back to the coach. Um, so they, I then described it as I think we can detrain the transition moment. So he was spending the first 15 minutes of practice not training or detraining that anticipatory moment of transition. You add that into the arrival activity that the kids might have done where they weren't on the front foot or back foot. And I think that that's the danger that in the chat box people are saying, can we train it? we can fundamentally put it in a lot of our practice designs. So I think recognising what you do in your early parts of sessions and is it just five, six passes and then the ball goes dead and everyone stands on their heels or actually are there some rules you might put on them where players have to break out of an area and the other players have to react and win the ball. So you've got the ebb and flow of in and out and transition going on. And, and just from your experience, Steve, I was going to ask you about how how you sort of bring this to life in an in possession perspective. Yeah, how you how you almost link everything together? If we're saying transition happens all the time, and there's the flow of the game. I think Jeff's spot on. I think uh, and Richie mentioned it as well. I think uh, transitions should uh, tend to be in every single practice, or at least encouraged to be in most. I think from from my own personal playing experience, I used to absolutely hate sessions when it used to be attack v defence we'd have an attack, we'd give it away, there'd be a ball come in the box and some of the coaches and managers I'd work with, I'd say, I'll just blast it out now. And I'd be like, well, come game day, come Saturday, you're going to expect them to play and, to, and we're now in possession. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because we're just working on defending. I'm like, well, no, there's actual transition bit because I used to think that I could go and regain and I'd hunt the ball back quickly, back tackle, and then we'd be on the attack again. And if I didn't do that, again, I think I mentioned it before, I think you tend to be preaching bad habits because come on Saturday, if I don't do that, my coach or manager is going to be shouting at me. Well, we're now out of possession. Go and get the ball back. But all week I've been training. Actually, it doesn't really matter. So I, I definitely agree with that. I think the amount of practices that you can uh, have transition in is more beneficial. But that's not to say, obviously, there is a place for repetition and encouraging the the, the flow in terms of building up resilience, the mentality to to stem attack, 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 and defend. But I think that the more and more I see practices that work. The players enjoy them, the players are getting more out of them. It surely has to have transition in, in the majority of them. And just to bring it back to you, Richie, obviously one of our principles um is, is win the ball cleanly, with the obvious uh, benefit of them being able to go on the counter-attack. So move from defense to attack. Yeah, and I think it's you know, this day and age now you can't actually make contact, you can't go to ground, so to speak. So the reason we, you know, we spoke about winning the ball cleanly is that. There's got to be a, you know, there's got to be a, an intelligence to your defending. There's got to be a, a process that you have around, you know, you have to, de you have to delay it so you can wait for that moment to, to win the ball and win it cleanly. There's got to be an opportunity that if you see the ball that, and you're not going to give a file away, you can do it. And I know, you know, it's probably a, a used expression a lot about it. It's, it's an art defending. Well, it couldn't be more truthful now in terms of the, the rules and regulations that don't allow you really to make contact. So you've got to use that defending as intelligently and 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 precisely as, as you can in these days and, and making sure that when you do win the ball it, it, it is clean and you and you're not you know you're not giving files away and sort of the last point I, I, I will make it just popped into my head then is 
you know, when you're talking about transition is, you know, the, the, the defenders know how to defend the space because we, you know, on transition, especially if you've getting teams, you do play in the space and do play in behind. It's, it's having that, it's having that understanding of, do you know how to defend space? Do you delay? Do you, do you, do you go in too soon uh, and then get spun? So there is so much you can coach around the transition, but again, say so you can do that in different practices. And just to, just to bring the conversation on, we, we spoke at the, at the outset about uh, the principles of play and, and how they interact with the performance problems. Um, so we're just going to bring some examples to life, aren't we, Jeff, in terms of how these performance problems might look in the game? Yeah, and we've put one particular example up. And it's interesting, always chatting with Richie. Richie's view is of the game as the defending and the transition bit. And my view has always been of the attacking bit and how do we how do we penetrate? How do we go around over or through teams? Um, and I think it's really interesting when we watch football now about teams that park the bus and can have success doing it. So, yeah, that, that's a big one for me about how do we how do we do that? So just just to give a bit of context to the example, so on the, t- the top left and right above the above the uh, the blue line, we've got how to how to build so we've got some examples of of principles around build the attack and then below we've got some examples about pressing in this case high up the pitch so it's almost a how to build under high pressure scenario so this is this is some of the performance problems the players might face on a match day so i'm just i'm just looking at there the the first top right the the player highlighted is the right back rolling inside to provide some support so what sort of challenges would that give the team that are trying to press in yeah, I think, you know, we, we've got, you know, all these different rotations and, you know, people try and, you know, and quote me if I'm wrong from an in-possession point of view, because obviously I, I also look at the game from an in-possession point of view, because, you know, you've got to look at both sides of the game and, you know, when people are rotating and when people uh, are moving positions and dropping into false fullback positions and rolling inside, and coming in off the line, they're trying to disorganise your structure, really. And I think... You know the the easy thing to do is is see these players pop up in different positions and get a rush of blood and and then try and press them and that's what they want they want to try and pull you and, and pull you out of positions and disorganize you and I think from an out of possession point of view if your strategy is right it shouldn't really change um, your pressing principle or your tactic how on how you and how you press that because again we we do come up a lot and when, when I spoke before about training and. These are the kind of problems they put up against us about people rolling in different positions and what's your job and what are you going to do about it. So I think as long as you've got a clear strategy and game plan of where and how you press, um, if you if you do press, by the way, is is um, is is paramount really. Yeah, and just to bring the conversation on in terms of the tactics and strategies and, and the game plan and how that all fits together, Steve, Jeff, have you got any any stories to to share about this? Well, I think that that visual that you're that you're referring to in terms of um, Manchester City, it's you know it's, they've got a five e three. Je- Jeff mentioned the point before about it's quite common practice now, and, and a term that's been banded around a lot is we're trying to encourage independent decision makers. Now we, we can't see the bigger picture there in terms of the whole pitch, but if that's the right back rolling inside, he could be standing in a traditional fullback position and he's actually that pass is being cut off by someone else now is he showing a, a really good intelligence by rolling into the space and providing an option so we can receive on the back foot open out and the entire pitch is his oyster now again you're trying to refer this back to practice design and that sort of consistency and alignment uh to mirror practice to, to game day is that would coaches who are on the call really on a game day have a go at that fullback at times and say, well, where are you going? I don't want you going in there, stay in your position. But actually, he's showing a really good mindset because he can recognise an opportunity, which is probably a little bit against the norm of popping up in a position. And he could potentially receive that ball. And if he doesn't receive the ball, he's probably creating and enticing the opposition to go and press him to create space for others. But I do see. Um, some coach of the week and in training for game day because it's about results whether it's under sevens nines thirteens seniors that they're worried about the results and actually i don't want you to do that 
yeah, some of the chat coming in about creating overloads and they, they've got a five five e three and should get out and, and that like you say, that linking to that intelligence of them the reason why they've done that. Um Richie, I'm just showing that the bottom left in terms of pressing, you can see the mentality to go and get pressure on the ball and actually the support behind it. So when yeah. one goes, the rest of the team follow and that sort of linking to the, the principles you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, and I think um, without knowing the context around this particular uh, snapshot here, you know, it, obviously the, there's been a trigger whether that's um, the winger pressing the centre half to to go and to go and engage, and then obviously it looks like you've got a jump and fullback. So it, you know the, the the importance of recognising triggers to go and press, and then looking at the support behind so everybody reacts. So you know when when you you know especially with our, the couple of pressing strategies that we've done in the past where when your winger does go and jump high and does go on the centre half, it, it is up to your full-back to go and jump. Uh, whether that's your full-back is, is playing, their opposition full-back is playing high, you're looking at your opposition full-back to jump on them. Uh, and then what does it look like for the midfielders? What does it look like for the centre half? Is the centre half covering round? What's it look like for the deep midfielder? Uh, and making sure that every single player knows the job and knows the role when there is a pressing strategy. Wonderful. And just, just to bring it on to the next sort of example, um, we spoke about Jeff playing through a, a low block, deep block, park the bus, everyone behind the ball, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the bottom right, you've got Wolves, who have got uh, 11, 11 players in that picture, so in a 30 by 30 area. Yeah, we, we did a webinar uh, around about December, January time, and we looked at the low block and we did quite a lot of work on Wolves. So I spent about six weeks watching them and really enjoyed from the defensive point of view how they were organized the 5-3-2 where everyone drops into a nice shape or a 5-3-1-1 but from the attacking point of view um how do you how do you then break them down and i think that particular picture was against man united and man united really tried to switch the play a lot to get them shifted and wear them down over the time of the game and i think it comes back again to this question of when and where do teams do things and why do they do it really back to the original principles slide of what principles are we going to apply when we come up against a defense that is like that because that is really hard to break down and that's why wolves have had great success highly organized um, you know and is that a switch of play to get out the other side is it the fullback coming around on the overlap the other side there are all sorts of tactics and strategies that teams will use to break it down but yeah that's becoming one of the commonest problems and, and just just to jump on that i was at that particular game it's only just come to me attention now i was at that particular game and i think like jeff said it was um wolves are very organized and they do get people behind the ball quickly but i think the the again the clarity of what the roles are was was so evident and united do try and change the play and they did try and change it sorry quickly and they had lots of ball speed to switch it out wide but the mentality and the mindset of the the two side of the three, so the three in front and, and getting across and screening passes, it it was incredible to watch. But as I say, and, and t the thing that I come away from that game was the, the clarity of the roles and their attitude and mentality to want to do it. Yeah, and, sh and sure, and if you, you can understand the the when, the where, and the why, I guess that leads you on as a coach to then understand how you go about coaching it to your players and how you deliver them key principles and messages to your group. Hmm. Steve, any, uh, any, any final points on that as a, as an attacker trying to, trying to break down that block? I think as a, as a coach, um, you've got a variety of ways to try and hurt the opposition. And, and we've mentioned obviously that the principles that we've referred to from penetrating early, if you can, or penetrating here, creating space movement, whether you get the ball wide, whether you cross, um, looking at that picture specifically that we were referring to about, about the Wolves Man United game, if you are going to switch the play and you're going to get the ball out wide, are you then going to cross the ball? And then the reason why I say that is what if you've got a number nine who's or a number 10, depending on your formation, who actually can't head the ball, they're not very good at heading it, but you're crossing the ball. So you've got to have an under, understanding of a personnel, your strength, your style. Do you stick to your belief and your philosophy that you've worked on for a number of weeks, knowing that something will come good? Do you rely on personnel who can pull one out of the bag from 30 yards? Do you think that someone's going to, a number 10, a Mason Mount, a Jack Grealish can produce a little bit of brilliance and that type of creative play? Um, 
it's not easy. And uh, the game that sticks out into my mind is England Iceland a few years back when we absolutely killed Iceland in terms of possession and dominance, but couldn't create many goal scoring chances. And I think there's more, sorry, there's less and less David and Goliath uh, results happening because lesser lesser ability teams are actually getting more organised out of possession and it's becoming more and more difficult to, to break down, which I think Richie's alluding to with the England national teams now and how well they've done over recent years. It's becoming so difficult to, to actually play and beat some of these teams and the results aren't as, wide as wild as they used to. There's not so many fours, five, six, sevens anymore because they're actually quite tight, the games. Um, it's very good, difficult to break down a team. I think as a coach and a, and a manager, you just got to give your players as many tools as possible and as many options to break down the opposition. And it's about knowing the different personnel, the strengths and weaknesses, players on, on similar wavelengths. And you've got those almost triggers and perceptual skills about who's going to do what at any given moment. And I, and I think just to, to re, uh, reiterate that point around, these are the moments in the games where you, you do need your, your 1v1 specialists. I mean, we're blessed. We've got wide players like your Hudson Adoy and uh, Sancho's who have got terrific ability in 1v1 areas out wide who can beat a player but can also get a ball in the box. And, you know, from a, from a defending point of view, <clears throat> and I'm doing a bit of work of it around the, at the moment about defending crosses. It's, it's one of the hardest parts of the game for the defender to, you know, get these different type of crosses coming in the box, whether it's a whip cross, a driven cross, and a box that comes in, a cross that comes in from the edge of the box, and then you've got your fullbacks who are, you know, coming up against one v ones who are trying to beat you to the byline with the pace. So, I think there's lots of variety of ways of breaking it down, but it's recognizing how to break it down and what what players really need to get on the ball to break it down. Yeah, and, and hopefully we're taking on this this journey uh, for people listening in about fitting these principles and styles and tactics and strategies around your personnel and, and what players you've got at your disposal. Yeah, definitely. Um, wonderfully on time, fellas. That was like it was planned. I mean, we had another time doing it, which we, we have done. So just a bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, I'm just going to throw up from this side. Obviously, it'll go on our FA YouTube page. Um, I know there's, there's some about uh, audio issues. Um, hopefully, the recording, uh, as I've seen at my end, should be fine. So any anything you've missed, you can go back and refer to that. Um, I'm going to make the handout available for us now. Um, you were the select 400 that's attended, so you get the special privilege of, of getting the slides as a PDF to refer back to. Um, so thank you, fellas, for your for your sharing your experience and your expertise uh, this afternoon. Any any final comments? No, thank you. Just thanks for listening, fellas and ladies. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Thank you very much. Thank you.